Hello guys, welcome along. This is Escapade uh, episode 30 and we're joined massive uh, guest. by a massive guest, uh, a guest that we've actually <laughs> been wanting to get on the show for a long time. Actually get you in the studio to be honest, we've not been in, in the studio since we started so we've been back and forward on the text trying to get this to happen so I'm delighted it's happening. Mark Sherry is on the show. Guys, how you doing? Ah, it's, it's been a long time, we've been talking has, about doing this for a long, long time. It has. We've had, we've had all, all the royalty of Scottish dance music on, do you know what I mean? Davy Forbes, Matt, uh, Malarca Lee, yep. Harvey mckay has been right. on. Yep. Uh, so it's good to have you on, mate. Thanks a lot, guys. How's things? Good. Aye, good. But it's been a busy, busy, I was going to say a few months, but a busy couple of years here. Just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it feels like. Yeah. Yeah. It's been good, really good. Yeah, busy so, times. So what's been happening over the last month then? Because you've got the, the album and all sorts of stuff happening, so tell us a little bit about that. Just... The la- that it's basically taken two years of my life to make that album, so I've just been non-stop in the studio. Um, I only got it finished in May. It was, in fact, it was sorry, it was April. Uh, Arnie from Black Hole basically gave me the deadline of about halfway through April to get all the tracks finished. I actually started this in 2017. Right. Um, I was doing another interview the other day there, and I was asked when I started it, and it was 2017, and the first track I did was with David Forbes, and that was a it was the remake of the track Datura, Yerba del Diablo, which is an old, old rave track from 1992 that me and Davey absolutely love uh, from the Piv Hangar 13 back in the day. So we, we kind of thought it'd be a good starting point to kind of make a remake of that. So that's on the album, but it's, it's been two years, like probably about, I'd say about 18 months to actually re- make the music, but to come up with the concepts and get all the samples and all the preparation and stuff to actually finish it from start to finish. It's been two years, it's, so that, it's, a, it's a big job an album, isn't it? Aye, it's it's all looking like a scheduling as well because you can't just you can't really do it in bits and bobs. You've got to say, right, I'm now starting to work towards this album with the end goal. You know, mm-hmm. and all the I've obviously I'm really busy touring as well and doing all the gigs. So you've got to try and work out when is going to be the best time. When am I going to get big chunks of time in the studio? So that that that's probably the hardest part. You know, luckily writing music, I'm not a fast producer, but I've never really hit like a big you know part of my life where I've been like uh, had kind of writer's block I've always been pretty creative uh, creative. so it's just trying to get all that get it into your head that you know this is it we're actually going for it now I'm going to have an album mm-hmm. in like, maybe 18 months to 2 years mm. so it's a good good feeling once it's all kind did of done you, Did you think uh, or did you have a balance between releasing singles as well or is it just album now? Yeah, uh, well, that was that's the kind of hardest part as well because you've got to kind of schedule things I think probably about halfway through 2018, I kind of spoke to my manager, Stuart, and my man, my agent, Bram, in Holland, and I said, right, guys, we need to kind of think about, you know, how, how long can I go, how long can I sustain things without an actual really releasing a new track? So I think the last track, before the album, the last track I released was in October 2018, and that was the collab that I did with Richard Durant, uh, Cosmic Dawn. Right, so okay. after that point, that was the kind of last thing that I did. So that kind of gave me from October... To up until like April mm-hmm. uh, 2019 to really hold the singles back and then again going back you know talking to Arnie uh, from Black Hole he said you really want to release the first single from the album um, six weeks before the album then you want to release another one four weeks before the album maybe mm-hmm. like a vocal track yeah, yeah. and then the third one so that, that's wrong sorry four weeks before the album release the first single two weeks before release the second single make it a vocal track and then the album comes out and then third fourth fifth sixth singles follow the album so I had to kind of really hold things back until April but it was quite a quite a scary time because I'm mm. like I'm, I've just had all this music building up no singles in sight and you're obviously you're still I've still got to get gigs yeah. and things move so fast these days I'm like yeah. you know people are going to think I've just I've retired I've given yeah, up yeah. And something. there's a lot of a lot of worry a lot of stress uh, a lot of getting keyed up, you know, because you're just dying to get things going. But as soon as you start to release the music from the album, it was an amazing feeling because I released Confirm Humanity was the, the kind of main track in the album and that was the first one we released and that was a month before the album. So as soon as we kind of hit the big green button in that one, I knew that things were going to start to move really quickly. Mm. I mean, talk, take us through a wee bit of the selection process. How do you dwindle down? Because I'd imagine you make more tracks for an album because it's something you're it's showcasing who you are. 
So it's like, how do you go through that? Or was it a case of everything you started on ended up in the album? It, it kind of was like that. And I think I think guys like Davy Forbes, Davy could probably write 30 tracks and then pick the best 18. Just, just know, picks for 300, 300 tracks. tracks. <laughs> exactly. The guys, the guys, we all know the guy's a machine, you know, but I, I'm not, I'm not, I can't write as fast as Davy. So I, I suppose every single track that I started, I had a clear vision of what I was going to do with it and I knew how it wanted to sound. So basically I didn't finish it until... I, I, no, right, okay. get to the point where I thought right that this is as good as I can get this is going to be on the album mm -hmm. fair enough if I'd written a few tracks that I wasn't sure about then they wouldn't have gone on there mm -hmm. but I just kept on chipping away every single track until it was up to what I thought was my best my best work you know yeah. so, do you find that hard to keep that identity of the track without like veering off and well, going oh there's another wee idea here that actually could be another tune but no 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 I keep won't fit the album uh, totally but see this year like mm -hmm. I'd written about five five or six of the tracks had been done last year but see from Christmas time until so April, things just happened really, really quickly, and it, it was it's the best time period of time that I've ever had in the studio, just purely because everything I tried was working. I was, you know, just just what you said there. I'd maybe come up with a melody, and I thought that's that could work in this other track. Mm -hmm. And there's a few of the tracks were in this, the same key, so I quickly stopped what I was doing, and I just kind of. I, up so, that so, that's, I, I've never done that before. I've always mm -hmm. stuck to the one track one project until it's finished right. but this album the last six months I've been jumping about all over the place going from track to track whatever took my fancy on, on the day or at that time mm -hmm. I just went with the flow and it, cool. it, it's something that I'm actually going to try again when it's when it's time to write another album or do some more tracks yeah, yeah. I'm going to consider you know jumping around and just whatever Having whatever mood I'm in that day yeah, ex nah, exactly cool. but I was taking even like vocal samples as well like some of the vocal samples that I had I was really trying to force a couple of things into this track and it, I was like no. Nah, I'm going to give up and then it just I get this little light bulb I thought That's, that could fit in that track so I changed the name of some of the tracks and changed the, the key of some tracks just to get things I had all these like jigsaw puzzle, uh, puzzle mm -hmm. pieces all over the studio floor kind of thing and I was just gradually picking them up and fitting them all together but luck, luckily it all came together mm. yeah. Is the album mixed? It's, it's not mixed, but it could easily be a DJ set, and right, I, I was okay. I was really adamant that it was going to be like that. Even mm -hmm. like Arnie probably won't mind me saying, but Arnie had said, "Oh, you know, I'm not too sure about the running order of the tracks. You should really have some of your biggest tracks at the start, and maybe a few of the vocal tracks." I'm like, "Well, the vocal tracks are one three eight or one three six, one three seven, so I don't really want those at the start. I've got I've done a techno track with Malaka Lee. I've got other shuffly kind of tech mm -hmm. like slower tech trance tracks that I've done. Mm -hmm. So I want I want it all to I want people to press play and it starts." Off here it's and just agile. gradually builds like yeah. a DJ set, yeah, and I was like really, it. I really wanted to stick to that. So I said that to Arnie. Fortunately, he's a really open-minded guy, and he's like, just you know, do what you want. I've, I've got faith in you. Mm -hmm. And that, that you know, if you start the album, that's actually how it starts. It starts off at one two eight. I think it finishes about one one four two or something. So it's uh, it's quite a, a good builder. Proper what about the name? So what's the name? It's uh, I could talk about this for hours, but I'm, I can't do that. So it's basically I, I was trying to come up. I knew that I was going to write an album two years ago and probably at the start of 2017, I thought, again, talking to Arnie, he said, you know, you should really have like a, a kind of concept or a theme behind the album. And I was like, oh, I, you know, I don't really know. It kind of, that kind of limits where I could go with it. But it turned out it was the exact opposite. It was, uh, you know, these kind of capture websites you get if you try and log into a website, you get like a capture screen and it says confirm humanity to continue or something. Or you have to tick the box. Ah. Say, I'm, I'm not a robot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this... I, the first time I'd, I saw that was at the start of 2017 and I thought that's effing scary you know it's ah, like yeah. we're actually, we've actually reached the point where <laughs> we've got to tell our prove to our yeah, computers yeah. that we're not robots you know mm -hmm. so that kind of whole started this kind of whole like all these little light bulbs started going off so that was the initial thing I thought confirm humanity no, nobody's used that I googled it on Beatport or, sorry I searched for it on Beatport googled it and stuff and there was not, not really anything coming up that was related to you know trance or dance music so I thought right that's going to give us a basis and the mm -hmm. kind of foundations of what I, I like want to do. And then obviously there's another track on there called I'm Not a Robot. So that kind of ties cool. in with that. But the whole the whole thing is just basically around technology, artificial intelligence, you know, what, what we're here for on this planet, you know, all this kind of stuff. But also there's, there's two programmes that I watched which really kind of sparked out a, like a lot more... Uh, ideas and I, have you ever, did you watch Dark on Netflix? No, it's a German thing called Net and uh, called Dark. And if if you watch it in German subtitles or the English subtitles, it's actually better watching it in German. Just in case somebody's going to go and start watching it, so oh, it's in German. I can't watch it, but it's it's amazing and it's all about time travel as well. And there's a track on there called Triquetra, which ties in with the whole album is kind of based around past, present, and future. So I wanted to, to 
like some of the tracks on there are more related to my older sound, so that was the past. There's obviously stuff in the present, and I tried to kind of tie it in with the futuristic sound mm -hmm. as well. So there's this thing called Triquetra, and the Triquetra is a it's the symbol for the Celtic cross, but it also can mean past, present, and future. Because if you look at the symbol, it's like three kind of curved shapes that, that meet in the middle and in this middle of the logo that's basically where past, present and future can all meet and that's that ties it in with the dark thing on Netflix because it's all about time travel and how this little boy goes missing years ago and there's this little kind of uh, wormhole thing and there's people coming like passing through from past, present and future so that that was like another part of it as well nice. so that tied it in with that and then going back to the kind of third aspect of it I saw this um, I was on a flight going somewhere and I saw this documentary, and it's the guys, Martin Fishburne, that was in The Matrix. Is it right, Martin? Yeah, okay. Is it Martin Fishburne? You know, the, the black yeah, guy that you're plays... you probably better telling it. He plays that. Morpheus. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, Lawrence, Lawrence, Fish Lawrence, Lawrence, Lawrence Fishburne, right. Yes. So he's, he's, done, he's done this documentary called Year Million, and it's about, in the future, all these scientists and professors are basically thinking that we're going to get to the point where when we die, it's only our bodies that die. We can basically take all our thoughts and our imagination and our electronic electrical like, pulses that are in our brain, we could basically download those into like a some kind of USB stick or something. Yeah. The cloud. Could, ex exactly. <laughs> yeah, and you yeah. can live out your life in this place. So this is the thing. The last track in the album is called Arcadia. And it's about you having to prove that you're human so that you can get access to this place called Arcadia. So yeah. this this Arcadia place is like a, a kind of virtual reality. It's quite black place. mirror. Aye, so where you can live out the rest of your life as... Mm -hmm. you know whatever you like it's like kind of virtual reality kind of thing it's like that film real player one you know you can do whatever you like in this mm -hmm. so yeah. it's all about existence you know what's what are we here for what's our purpose where are we going to go when it when it when it goes tits up yeah, you know yeah, yeah, so there's, cool. a, there's a lot of ideas in there but it, to me it, it maybe to other people it doesn't make sense but in my head it all kind of makes a story throughout the whole album well, that, that's so, what an album is all about though it's, <coughs> you yeah. mentioned earlier it's about who you are as an artist and yeah. what you're into and right. how that all that ties yeah, in it's pretty cool it's great hearing it, how the, all that comes about actually you know it's it's good to chat it over aye, aye, aye. And, yeah. and hear it from your well, side. Like, it's feel like it's like a, a council session talking about <laughs> I mean, I think, though, to hear it from you is important, as aye, Stephen cool. says. And also, we could probably film another podcast talking about all that we kind could. of stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. You mentioned a track um, that you've done with Davey. That was a flashback to so Hangar. The Hangar 13, that, so back in 92. That, I think that's a good segue to go, right, well, obviously that's back in the... Back the, I guess when you and Davey kind of cut your teeth or when you were working together and yeah. all that. So I think that's probably a good place to start in terms of what were you doing at that point and how did that? How did you end up going from here to there from uh, there to here? Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, Davey, Davey's got a couple of years on me. He, he was a, <coughs> he, so he was a resident. <coughs> he was a resident at Hangar Thirteen, which you know some people are watching don't know. It was in the Pavilion, which is a big kind of like a old like historical building on Air Air Beach. And uh, it was basically just a rave every week, absolute carnage. You know, maybe like a thousand to maybe twelve, thirteen hundred people were in there every single weekend. And I was maybe like 17, 18. So I'd just kind of cut my rave teeth. I'd mm -hmm. been going to the Bobby Jones in there before that, where Trevor Riley was the resident. That was his kind of first, like, kind of, I suppose it's the first club in Ayrshire where he really became really popular for doing, for playing the kind of rave stuff. So Trevor got offered a job at the hangar. I followed Trevor to the hangar. And Trevor had a lot of connections with the guys in Glasgow. And I think Davey had a residency in Glasgow where Trevor started working as well. So okay. Trevor got talking to Davey and says, look, I'm starting a residency at the hangar. I love what you're doing. You come down and join the team kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it was basically Neil Skinner was doing the first hour, who I went to school with. MC Cyclone does his stuff right. for Die Witness. Okay, so it's quite a kind of close knit. Right, right. Neil used to do the first hour, Davey used to do the second hour, and then Trevor went on after that. So I kind of met Davey in the piv. Like I was down the front of the stage going for it every week at the hangar. Raving to Davey. Exactly. Right? <laughs> Dave, Dave the Rave, you know. So that, that, that was my first. And I, I, I used to talk to him because he, before he went on, he used to kind of stand at the side of the stage like, talking to the guys down the front. And I always kind of said hello and I loved the kind of stuff he was doing. So I got friendly with Davey, like in really, I think it was 93, it was maybe the first time I'd, I'd met Davey. And then from there, we just kind of sparked up a good kind of, just a kind of friendly, friendly relationship and talking about tunes. And mm -hmm. eventually we obviously started working together a lot. And you know, we ended up joining public domain later on in the day as That's well. That's right, so actually. You see, he joined <coughs> later on. You yeah, told me that years ago. Yeah, yeah. He's like the kind Aye. of fifth, fifth member, like kind of fifth member of the Beatles kind of type thing. Aye, bro. <laughs> so it's like after, because after Malacca joined, because uh, there's... 
we've got a lot of history together like, yeah, between yeah. Malorca and myself and uh, Davey and Trevor so it's quite, quite cool it is cool those rave yeah. days I've got a lot to answer for don't they yeah, it's, it's, it's sparked so much the, the scene in the Scotland just now it's just terrible for like, you know for, for trance and dance music let's see mm. down in here used to have like the Hangar you would Bobby Jones you would the Babylon you would Excess Nightclub you had uh, you had the Aquarium and Irvine you had the Metro and Solco it's, they're all gone you know mm. it's, it's depressing really know, depressing like, yeah, people are picking whether they're wanting to go out now it's like you know the big shows you know yeah. I, think, I guess I mean why and obviously why? the Archies as well you know it's, well it's, that's a major one that, but yeah. why do you think that is then because obviously it was so thriving I've got my ideas probably why it's happened but I mean why do you see I, that I, I can't I don't know mate I, I can't really put my finger on it it's, it's difficult to actually pinpoint one moment in time or one thing that's happened that's caused it mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know I, for, for me now I think it's just because a, a lot of it I think now like maybe not like maybe like 10 years ago but I think now it's all about Instagram you know kids are just going out or get, you know people our age are just going out and I'm obviously older than you guys but people are going out and then instead of just going out raving and not giving a shit what they look like and yeah, yeah. going out sweating their asses off all night, they're thinking about where they're going, thinking about wearing their best clothes, thinking about who they're going to spend time with, thinking about, you know, going to stupid like bars to sit with the like bottle service yeah, and yeah, yeah. big Massively bottles of vod vodka coming with sparkles coming it's like fuck off you know yeah, it's yeah. like get back and get back into the raves back you know because like, it used to be all about the music but unfortunately it's not all about the music anymore There's there are a lot of places in different countries and different parts of the world where fortunately it is still about the music but mm -hmm. for whatever reason in Scotland it's just not like that but I think a lot of it's got to do unfortunately with drugs and the councils and you know, the clubs just have a lot of pressure under them to kind of you know oh, to try and, but that's again that's not there you're not going to stop you, you that. can't control it you know you so can't. yeah but that, that's that's my kind of thought on it it's, it's pretty sad i'm hoping it changes i'm hoping it comes back around again but just now it's quite a depressing I mean, time thinking about <coughs> like musically uh, as well i mean techno in scotland i'd say for that sort of scene is is I'd the most say, thriving yeah you look at terminal v first there it's like fifteen thousand folk in the royal highland center uh, and, and that's, that's the way it should be. That that's is, that's the way it was back in the day when you think, the resurrection and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and all of that's like essentially it's called techno, but it's it's essentially rave music. And yeah. It's essentially a lot. Of it's trancey. Yeah. So it's like the scenes moved up sticks. Yeah. And like it's, it's just it, it operates in a different kind of realm now. Yeah. You know? I think it's good because you've got all these different genres <clears> and they are starting to meet in the middle, like progressive house, progressive trance, trance, tech trance, techno. That's what I think it's, needs to happen. It's really it's the way it's going. It's like the most interesting time. Yeah. It's been for dance music in a long, long time. Yeah. So hopefully that's going to get the younger kids I into the so. music, and hopefully that will spur, like, uh, inspire people to go to clubs to search for that music and go to festivals and all that kind of stuff. Like you're, you're a big advocate of like playing a set of like half a unknown tunes. Yeah. You know, so people are like, I want to go and see that DJ because you don't really know what they're going to play. I suppose yeah. to play that tune for yeah, me. No, exactly. You know? that's and which is a lot of that now. It's like, can yeah. you play this sound or this track? It's like, no, uh, I'll yeah. decide. A lot of EDM's <laughs> got a lot to blame for as well. You know, all these EDM DJs that play for like an hour and they're playing like 20 tracks in an hour, three minute long tracks and stuff. And they're just, the whole set's like that. It's like anthem, 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 you know, just get back to basics, yeah. start, you've got to build, you know, but again, it's down to the festivals and the promoters to book DJs for longer set times as well, yeah. to let, give guys like myself <clears throat> and you guys the time to experiment, the time to start down here and build it, mm -hmm. instead of just, right, sure. you're on, you're on for an hour, peak time, play all your biggest tracks. Exactly. And so the crowd get bored because it's like, it's like that for the Because then the night. next DJ comes on and does the same thing. And it's exactly. like every big tune you can imagine. Sometimes you're getting the same tracks in each set. Right. And you're like, man, there's more music yeah. out there. Than I know. That, I, you know? I even like, I mentioned, I'm not going to mention names, but a, a couple of promoters have told me stories about guys <coughs> that they've booked, like the EDM guys, and the next DJ's running late. So they go up to the guy and say, look, can you play for an extra 10 minutes? And they're like, no, we don't. No, I've planned I, my I've, set, dude. I've got, I've got, I've got an hour long, and that you know oh, that's man, got, that's, that's a like, pet, that's a pet hit of mine. Oh, really it's just, oh, that's it's shocking, crazy, man. You know, that's that's not a DJ. No, at no, all. that's a no. jukebox. No, that's, that is, <laughs> but uh, see, the thing is, as well, though, one thing I would maybe say, though, talking about we're going back to the old rave days, or trying to, and all of that doesn't seem to be as much. There are now a lot of clubs that are advocating for no using phones. Yep. Yeah, so they're cool. like. Well, but I would also say the other reason to that is is because there's ten bodies in, so they're like, don't show any of this video. Don't tell me you're getting away. There's one there's one guy that I work for called Rami, and he he does the uh, circus after hours events in Montreal, and he does an event called Trans Unity. And I'd, luckily, I do a lot of work for this guy, but he puts on one event, like well, he puts on more than one event a year, but he does one event 
which is like a thing called TransUnity. It's two rooms, maybe about 15 to 20 DJs, and you are not allowed your phones. That's and he's just taking it back to the old school. Mm -hmm. He's looking at it like a warehouse rave party. It's all about the music. They don't put any DJ sets online. There's no, you know, live footage. There's no Facebook Live. You have None to be None of the there. sets get recorded. If you want to experience it, and see the DJs that you want to see and hear the tracks you want to hear, you've got to go and then that's it. So once the event's over, there's no like mm -hmm. social media things going on after it. It's just that's it. The night's gone. Mm -hmm. You need to look forward to the next one if you want to come back. And it's see that the atmosphere, mm. the last one I played, it's just, it's incredible. Much and better. it's the closest thing I've found to the hangar back in the day in right, some okay, of the big waves cool. in Scotland. That's interesting. So if you just remove that whole social media thing with your phones, mm -hmm. put your phones in your pockets and get dancing just and dance. just react to the DJs and you know, mm. so. See, I think it's a double-edged sword with the social media side of stuff because if you are a DJ on the rise or you're an up-and-comer, you're not getting many gigs, you're, you know, your fee's not very high, if any, you know, and when on the, on the sort of climb up. So when people have got the phone out and they're taking videos, that for you is good for your exposure. Let's say at the place is going off, it's a great video, and it's like, you know, that's going to help. But then the other side of the spectrum is you've got a big DJ who's got all the exposure in the world. It's like, I put the phones away, I don't uh, want that. You know, it's like, yeah. where do you find that balance? Yeah, but I think on, on the actual night to remove the phones, I think it's okay. But, you know, if, obviously some events, it's, it's going to be fine to post your DJ set after it's done and dusted. Because that's really for the like folk in their bedroom or, you mm -hmm. know, people back home who didn't make, like, make it along to the night so mm -hmm. they can play your set in the car or whatever. But I think on the night, it's quite an, it was quite an important thing. I, I just noticed in Montreal, I thought, that, that really worked tonight, mm -hmm. you know, because there's just, it, it just removes all it that does. stuff. It removes the fact that people are standing there with their phones trying to record you. There's yeah. nothing worse when you're like smashing it out, having a great night, and you look up and there's some guy in front of you just holding your phone like that in front of you, like, no! <laughs> with a light on. Uh, no, exactly, exactly. Uh, you don't get that as much anymore, but yeah, that's really annoying. It's crazy though, but it is such a, a change in landscape now. Yeah. Uh, especially for, you mentioned promotion there, like, you know, what options have you got to promote yourself? You know, with the amount of noise out there and the amount of DJs as well, the amount of producers and stuff like that as yeah. well, like social media seems to be one of the main ways that people are getting noticed yeah. as well, obviously as the music, but a, a solid social media presence is getting so many people booked mm -hmm. yep. when we're, we're scratching our heads thinking, how, oh, how why did that are they happen? booked? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some even, the, there's a documentary on the Netflix, and I can't remember what it's called, it's the cheesiest thing I've ever seen in my life. Don't know any of the DJs. Some sort of Johnny Sunshine or something like that. And he's just this cheesy, cheesiest guy I've ever met. And it's like, this doesn't at all resonate as if this is DJing, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. like two girls on the, like they're coming up. It's more like a band that's playing yeah. as opposed to DJs. You know, they're proper going for it, you know? And it's like, fair enough, but it's like more of a concert. Yeah. So America's made the, the, the dark underground raves, the, you know, I guess that kind of, America's made it really poppy. I think, do you know what I mean? Ex it's created a lot love. of the other stuff. But I mean, it's it's at, the same, I, it's, at the same time as well, I read an interview with Armin today, Armin Van Buren, and he's talking about how David Guetta actually opened up the doors for dance music in America recently, because it was when he started going over there mm -hmm. and he had these big dance tracks in the charts, mm -hmm. that opened up the doors to so many, like all the EDM, fair enough, it was EDM, you know, I've, I've, it's probably quite obvious that I don't like that kind of style of music, mm -hmm. but that did open up so mm -hmm. many doors and opportunities and kick kickstart a lot of events and re big these big festivals yeah, in America, yeah. you know, because of the commercial lead into it. Well, they're playing massive catch up though. Yeah, because they are there. They don't know, but they, even though techno and stuff came from America. I was going to say that they, they they started at the exact same time as then, us back in the day, but uh, yeah, they kind of lost their way a bit. But now they're back, it's back full force. Let's see, there's some of the events over there just now. It's going mental, you know. It's, mm -hmm. it's like for trance and for techno, massive festivals, massive clubs, so many different. You know, cities are putting on these amazing nights, and it's just it's, it's we just need to take a leaf out of that book again. Mm -hmm. You've mm -hmm. got Miami, don't you? Like I've not I've not been to that week, and is it March they do it? Yeah, yeah. And it the just winter looks conference, amazing. Yeah, but even even that that's kind of died a little bit. There's there's so much other many other good things going on in America. Man. Yeah, yeah, that, that you know, yeah, yeah. But there's there's just not as many other things going on like in Miami as there used to be. Mm. But there's so many other things like really cool, you know, club nights and festivals going on. The whole thing is kind of really kicking off over there. How's, how's New York? Like you've been there a few times. I, I, I'm actually going back there. Uh, going back in uh, two weeks, I think it is. I'm doing a, a big event. It's the Escala guys that mm -hmm. I play for. Again, New York, I think, has had a, a few kind of bits of trouble. Like, I used to play in a club in there called Cielo. And it's like, maybe like an 800 capacity club. And it's 
one of the best clubs that I've played in anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's a small, quite a small club, but the, the crowd are right in front of you, and mm -hmm. they just go absolutely apeshit, you know. Mm -hmm. And but unfortunately, that even that club hit, hit, you know, hit troubles, and it's now closed. So the Scala guys working kind on of trying to you know find new venues and stuff but they're now doing this big two-day festival called escalation and i think it's myself and john o'callaghan and brian and you know, all the kind of the guys the kind mm -hmm. of trans guys are on the saturday night but they're doing this big kind of sci festival on the friday night as well but yeah new york's it's an amazing scene an amazing city um but there's again there's maybe you can maybe like pick and choose what nights to go to there's maybe mm -hmm. like one good trans night a, a month in New York, you know, it's, right. it's, I suppose you can kind of compare it to maybe like Glasgow or something like mm. that. You know, maybe we'll fight not not with trans actually, but we we can attack the yeah, nights yeah, and stuff. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Aye, America is an interesting place. Mm. You know, it's uh, it's cool. You were saying like Detroit and like, that's Chicago. Where it, you know, oh, like, yeah, I love all that stuff. It all yeah. started there. You I've know, sampled like, so many like Detroit, you know, techno tracks out in my back in the day, getting like, the really cool like chordy tech the piano stabs and all that. Aye, kind of it's stuff. like the dub stabs. Yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Five amazing. finger chord. <laughs> I know. So Mark, you're just back from EDC then yeah. in America. Yeah. So how was that? It was incredible, uh, absolutely incredible. Uh, like I've I've um, I've started this project with my old friend Scott Project. Frank Zenker from Germany. Bit of a legend. He's a, oh, he's a, a great guy, but he's just such a legend. You know, he's some of the tracks he's written over the years. They're all absolutely Mon right in your face monsters. bangers. But they're, they're, he's a, a great guy. One of the most kind of talented like trans producers out there. So we're doing this kind of back to back concept called Gentech, which was kind of off the back of uh, we've played at Dream State together in November last uh, last November last year, and that was in uh, California and uh, San Bernardino and that was the kind of first gig that we did as Gentech so it's like a back to back thing we're mm -hmm. doing it's my 25th anniversary as a DJ and it's also Frank's so we thought well let, let's put together an idea and Jeff Ryan who runs Dream State basically said look guys we want to get you to, you know we want to get Mark to go back to back with somebody on this on the Dream State trans stage who have you got in, you know who have you got in mind this is him talking to Bram my mm -hmm. manager and Bram says well let's let's talk about Frank because Frank was getting managed by Bo who manages Lumi it's like Luminosity he's the main mm -hmm. him and his brother are the two guys behind Luminosity so they kind of come up with the idea because they're both Dutch they had a few phone calls and I think Frank, uh, Bram had said to Bo let's put Mark and Frank together and then it just kind of started from there so anyway we've done we've done a few gigs as Gentech but then we got the, the booking for EDC and I was just doing cartwheels because it's like it's massive. I can't tell you how big it is. It's like a massive big speedway out in the Nevada desert. And it's, wow. it's massive. There's like there's half a million people go to it over the three days. It's on like Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we were playing in the, the trans stage, uh, which is the Dream State stage. And we were closing the, mm -hmm. the Dream State stage on the Friday from half three in the morning to half past five. So the sun was just coming up as we wow. finished. So it was an incredible experience. And even just to like walk around and like, you know, see who else was playing. And, you know, Eric Prince was on just around the corner. He's got this massive big stage to himself. And I know it's cheesy, but David Guetta was playing in the main stage up the top and there's like masses of fireworks going off. And we just kind of walked around, like me and my wife, uh, Karen and uh, Frank, we just walked around the, the whole place for a few hours, just like, wow. Well, our mouth's open. You sound like, so <laughs> American, that. It's just so uh, big. Uh, like, it's so it's un unbelievable. Like, the, the production, I cannot tell you how good the production is. It's unbelievable. Hollywood. Every stage is, is it just all like, types of music. All types of music, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. cool. It's ma mainly mainly dance. You know, there's not really any. I didn't hear any like trap music or, or that kind of stuff. It's all yeah. pretty much four four. So cool, you've got like cool. techno. There's like hard style. You've got trance. Uh, yeah, it's, it's EDM. Just, yeah, EDM as well, of course. Yeah, the more kind of commercial stuff like David Guetta and all these kind of guys. But I mean, they've got a lot of the Njuna guys there as well. And you've got, you know, Carl Cox. And uh, I was actually, we we're on the same flight as, I've never spoke to Adam Bear before, but Adam Bear and Enrico Sanguiliano. San Giuliano. San Giuliano. Yeah. We're, all, we're on the same flight. And I was dying to go up and say, hello. But just, <laughs> yeah. uh, like, what do you say to the guy? Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Is that but, not the gig where Jace was playing and the guy showed up? It, it was, it was. <laughs> mate, it was and I'm like, oh my God. Only, yeah. only, only Jace could get a guy like that down in front that was something else <laughs> it, was it was hilarious if you ever if you see Jace ask him for the videos that he's got because they're just it's absolutely priceless <laughs> I, love, I just like you know whoever's watching this will need to go to Jace's page and see it but yeah. the way Jace reacted uh, to it was brilliant he's, he's, and then the guy's Back and forward text. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the guy took it well. He did it, take it well. I don't, think he, I don't think he could have done anything else apart from take it well. Fully naked, <laughs> down the front at a giggle, oh, mate. What are you doing? Oh, man. That's the first thing Jay said to us, like, after it, because uh, we, we arrived at the venue about maybe 11, 11 10, 11 o'clock or something, and he'd obviously played, he was on first at 8 until 9, I think. So when I saw him, I was like, how'd your set go? And without him really saying anything, he just said, 
That's how that's how it went there. Was like, this little guy was like, <laughs> like, like oh, I thought man. only you could do that, Jason. I know so that I, that was amazing, you know. And yeah. we were just chatting before we kicked us off about obviously a major point in your career was uh, public domain. Yeah. And uh, that sample, right? And it got us onto the subject of sampling and stuff like that, down the rabbit hole and stuff. But I sampling's it's it's a very interesting thing, and and we certainly talk about it a lot. Certainly, a lot. All, all the hip hop, you're blown away the fact it all came from 1960s James Brown, and you're like, wow, I know that we've tiny bit, yeah, yeah, the Amen loop and all that kind of break slip oh, and all yeah, that kind yeah, of stuff, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, brilliant, you know, absolutely amazing. And obviously with that track there, that was a sample, you know, and and, and you're saying a lot of people don't do that now, like as much as maybe they did. I think yeah, I think like Operation Blade had like two big. <laughs> howlers on it two really big samples and we pl- probably couldn't have sampled t- like two other <laughs> no, two bigger t- <laughs> but, you know new, new, new order on public enemy it's like, it's like <laughs> what are you doing yeah, if, if we phoned up a record label now and suggested that they'd be like eh, no chance aye, I know. you know so there was, so. Aye, but I think it's because of the vinyl thing like you used to always get acapellas and vinyls and that you know that's that's why there's so much like hip hop and rap stuff sampled in the old rave tracks because everybody was going through their record box trying to find samples because the technology was going from analog to digital so people could get sat they'd samplers they could take rip bits from tracks and you know regurgitate them and pitch, pitch you know pitch shift them and mm-hmm. slow them down and speed them up so that just but there's not that many people who have the access to vinyl anymore acapellas okay you can get acapellas online and stuff but i think it was just the whole excitement of trying to find acapellas like going into record mm. shops and you know getting samples and just trying to listen to stuff from the past I mean I, I've actually sampled quite a few things in this album um, like vocals and stuff but it's just really from like films and movies and stuff but I've done more sampling on this album than I've done like in the last maybe 10 years because mm-hmm. I've, I've had a great time doing it because it's mm-hmm. just the, the, the hunt of finding a good sample and making it fit or just sometimes you're lucky you do find a sample that fits in with the for track sure. that you're making but I, it's, it's a hell of a lot of fun yeah, it's fascinating to, for uh, me like Fatboy Slim Dr Dre you know all these guys look at what they've created careers and multiple people's careers and especially Dr Dre obviously but how Fatboy Slim it's essentially just big yeah, mashups f- Fatboy Slim and look at Moby as well Moby Daft did a Punk. lot of sampling in his like, the, oh, what's the, the album is it Play the album he did that's like a dating number ones on it or something like that wow. so he did a hell of a lot of sampling he was sampling a lot of like blues tracks and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff like really weird like old old American tracks you know so there's all, all that kind of st- stuff but I, it's, it seems to be it's kind of it's like an old art form it's mm-hmm. not really done as much anymore for whatever reason but sometimes you hear a wee track on the like the charts at Radio 1 or all that you're like hmm that's an old tune like there's one now and it's basically the same hook as Insomnia Faithless, Faithless and I don't even I think they've tried to mask it oh, right, see okay. if you know the track you're like you that's that yeah, yeah, they've yeah, changed yeah. a few notes yeah. but it's like definitely yeah there's that. a lot of that kind of stuff going on as well like a lot of the, the kind of kids a lot of, there's this new brand new track out and mm-hmm. you're like that sample such and such from yeah. like 20 years ago aye, that aye. the kids are too too young to kind of know. I think that happens every generation though, yeah, you know, because yeah. it was, it was the same as hip hop and then all the kids will be like, oh, you heard this mum and they'll be like, that's for, the, that's for Perry Como. What kind of music you're listening to? But, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's just like, you know, they, uh, yeah, they would have I been like, oh, that's for the 60s, like, See, oh, that's yeah. from, uh, you know, any of these, <laughs> any of these yeah, massive yeah. acts. So it's like, yeah. that'll always happen, I think. Yeah. That'll always happen. Aye, so I've got you know how take us back to the moment right where you were sampling like the big howlers you're talking about. Well, I, I saw the film Blade, right, and I, as soon as the big don't don't go don't don't as soon as that came in at the bloodbath scene, I thought I've got that in vinyl. And it, it took me about two or three weeks to remember what it was, and I thought you know I thought it was hard floor at first because I'm a massive hard floor fan. Mm-hmm. So is like you know Malorca and, and Forbesy were all oh, wow. massive massive fans of the kind of acid sound. And I thought, it's not hard flow, who, who else is it? And then I remember, pump panel, pump panel. And then I realised it's New Order Confusion and I had it in white label in my loft. So I went into my loft and was in there for days trying to find it because you couldn't really, there was no access to like that kind of music online at that point. It's kind of showing my age, but I had I knew that if I wanted Something to sample really cool it, I had that. to get it on vinyl. So mm. uh, anyway, I managed to find it. I'd, just, I'd been out on a night out. I wasn't in a band or anything at that point in my career. I was just kind of, just starting to kind of find my feet with DJ and locally and stuff. I was uh, out, out one night in air and uh, two guys come up to me, James Allen and Alistair McIsaac, and they kind of said, look, we know about, you know, what you've been doing recently with Trevor Riley. Um, we know that you can produce to a certain extent. 
you know, but we, we're kind of doing like a, a audio engineering course at the SE College in Glasgow just now. We've got a bit of kit, we've got some keyboards and stuff. Do you want to combine it all? And I said, well, yeah, okay. Let, let, I'm not doing anything, so let's give it a try. So I had my old keyboards. They had, uh, I think James had a, J, a JP8000 at the time and he did a Korg N5 and he had his, his computer was all kitted out for the Cubase and stuff. So I said, I said to the guys, I said, this is actually quite good timing. It's like, well, how come? So well, I'm, I'm DJing in the Metro and I've started playing out this pump panel remix of New Order Confusion on a Saturday night and people are losing their shit over it mm-hmm. because it's from the film Blade and it's like, and it was, I was playing it in the Metro and at any time I would stop the music and get, you know, get them all going crazy and then just dong, 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 uh-huh. dong, I've done that. And I don't know why, it's a, a crazy thing that happened, but I had an acapella of Flavor Flav saying bass for your face, London. So I just randomly started scratching over the top of it and then I was like cut, <laughs> cutting, the, cutting, the bass up, cutting the bass off it and just scratching and everybody was just like, you know, hands in the air. I'm and getting the just, shovels, man. Then, <laughs> I'm getting the shovel. <laughs> I'm not even getting on. You've been such a fan of this. Sir. You're actually, like, you're getting it. <laughs> and be, because, because the, tr- I mean, the track's about nine minutes long, so you could, mm. you could just play it and let it go. And it, you know, it's one of these tracks that just, you don't know how it builds, but it keeps on building and building and building and the 303 start to go backwards and there's all these like, effects and stuff and then the vocals mm. come in and you can just play that shit and everybody was losing it. So I thought, anyway, so I digress. I, I spoke to the guys. I said, look, I've got an idea for a track, but it involves some heavy heavy sampling. Do you mm. want to go for it? And like, yeah, let's, let's try it. So that, that was the first track we did together in, in James's mum's mum and his mum and dad's house in his bedroom. That's that's where we made it, and that's that was the first track we did together. Was it, was it one of those ones that just flowed together? It, you know, it came together really, really quickly. Yeah, yeah. Because at that time, Picotto, Mauro Picotto was uh, doing the whole kind of wop 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 all that kind of bass stuff, the BXR bass. stuff. Yeah, yeah. So all that was taken off, and I was like. I want a piece of that. That, That's Mm -hmm. me. I I love that kind of stuff because I've always been about big bass lines and big kicks and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I thought, let's just combine all these ideas and see what happens. And that that was the first track we did. But at that point as well, I just learned how to use the CDs they had. This kind of Denon twin CD player in the Metro. And before that, there was I'd never seen a CD player. I I didn't even know you could get CDJ players at that point. Mm -hmm. It was they'd always just been vinyl. Mm -hmm. So we burned the first version of Operation Blade to CD. And then I started playing it in the Metro and it was just, it was carnage, absolute carnage. And then we got it pressed up on White Label. I'm trying to, th- trying to think what happened. It signed to Slinky. Uh, Slinky made up more White Labels of it and then Jules played it in his Radio 1 show. I think his, his show used to be in the Friday at that time and I think he played it like, it was like either 13 or 14 weeks in a row he played it and then from there it got signed to Extravaganza. Uh, Alex Gold signed it and uh, then... That was it. That, that was the rest of history. <laughs> so, and then you then. changed the vocal by getting Mallorca we to cha- we changed, it. That was Alex from Extravaganza. So look, guys, we really need to get this vocal resung because it's you're not either you're either not going to get clearance or it's going to cost you an absolute fortune to get it cleared. So just you know, if you've got any friends or guys that you know that could do a good job, try and do what you can. He said, "I'll do." What I can. So he tried a few guys down in south, but they just couldn't couldn't get it. So then I thought, well, we've, we've got a Scottish guy. It sounds exactly, American. <laughs> exactly. So, so I, luckily, I'd, I'd met Mallorca a few times, and you know, at that point, I felt confident enough to phone him up and say, "Look, are you up for it?" And I respect him for doing this. He actually said no at first because he told he'd, me that. I, so he'd, he'd done this whole thing called Bikini State, what was like a hip hop thing that he'd done. Oh, he was few other guys. Fred Dust. So I, and it, it hadn't quite gone to plan and he was kind of in a bad place and he didn't really know, he thought, you know, and because of the whole ultrasonic thing as well, he'd been touring since he was like, what, 17, 18 years old. Mm-hmm. See, he, he's a wee bit, he's like two or three years older than me. See, he'd been touring longer than I had mm-hmm. as well. So he's thinking, I really want to get back into this. So then we, I managed, I, I just left him. I thought, well, just have a think about it. Mm-hmm. If you can, let us know within the next couple of days because if you don't do it, we really have to get somebody on the case with it because there's, there's I felt like a dick saying it to him. <laughs> but I said, there's a chance that this is going to go in the charts because Alex Gold was saying from Extravaganza, this has got a massive chance. It's going to be a hit, mate. It's going to be a hit. Yeah, smash <laughs> it, smash <laughs> it. <laughs> that's, this that's, one's going to be big, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make you a star. Exactly. <laughs> so exactly. so I, I felt, you know, I didn't like saying it, but he, he, he knew where it came from because he, he'd actually been in the Metro a few times and he'd heard me playing it and he knew that Jules was playing it. So it wasn't like a, you know, a pie in the sky kind and of thing. And you weren't lying. Not like Aye. So he thought about it and if, luckily he came back to us and he said, right, I'm, let's give it a shot. So we got him in and get, got the vocals resung and that, that was it. So just famous. Managed to get it all, managed to get all the samples cleared. 
Uh, we, you know, got a deal with Public Enemy and got a deal with the New Orders publishers as well, and managed to get it out there officially. It was, it was a, it was all I'm going to say was it's a, it was a sore one, but it, it, there was no other way we could do it because another thing as as well, some people might not realise, the German guys, the Watt Brothers, had a track called Fat Bass, and it, they'd recreated the acid from the the film Blade, and they were they were actually like. It was like in a race to see who Is could get right? it in the charts because Dave Pierce had signed that track to New Life, his label, at the same time. And because he was in Radio 1 on a Sunday night, Jules was playing our version on a Friday and Dave was playing their version on a Sunday. And it was like a, a race to the finish kind of thing. So Alex Gold was putting all this like really heavy pressure on us and you have to get this finished. You need to get it out there. Let's We're going to go for this release date. And if you don't do this by that point, we're going to have to move the release date. And that's the Watt Brothers are going to get theirs out before. And I'm like, oh. So it was like a really manic and stressful time. Unfortunately, in that space of time, we made a a shitload of mistakes as well. We didn't have a, a music manager, we didn't have the correct lawyers in place. So basically, you know, Moloka will tell you this, and Davey as well, we made every single mistake in the book, we made it in that short mm -hmm. space of time. But because of all the pressure we had on us to get that track out there, mm -hmm. to make it a hit, we just had to go for it, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, it's like a kind of double-edged sword. Double -edged you know, it's a really amazing time in my life, but it was also quite a dark time in my life as well. It was kind of up and, every day was up and down, up and down. So I mean, because that, that would totally taint that experience because you're looking at this as a way of like longevity in the game, having money behind you, sorting things out. However, even though some of that side of it never really came through, it did shoot your profiles through the roof, that oh, tune. It, it did. You know, and I was lucky because I was like, DJing in the band as well and I made all these contacts abroad because all of a sudden my career was it was gradually building in Scotland. You know, I was starting to get a lot of good gigs and stuff and I had residencies and things were going really well. In fact, you know, even before Public Domain, I couldn't have been happy with the way things were going for me in Scotland and I was starting to get booked down south and things were starting to go in other places as well. But then the Public Domain thing came along and that was like a global thing, you know, mm -hmm. just like bang, the gigs just went like that and all our careers just went skywards. We went along for a few years and then unfortunately just came straight back down again. So that was it was quite hard to adjust after that. But again, that's just because we made too many mistakes. There was too, I think there was too much pressure on us to perform. And at that point, the whole kind of like trance thing, like trance had stopped getting in the, in the charts, even though that was, we never intended to become a commercial dance band. Yeah. Unfortunately, that is what happened to Public Domain. And there was a hell of a lot of pressure on us to perform well, and get the next big that kind of that, thing. That's exactly it. When's so, the next one? When's the next exactly. one? Exactly. So it came to a point where mm. I just, Pulled the ripcord. I think it was. I actually, I actually stayed with the band like a bit longer than I probably should have. I think. I think it was about two thousand and eight, two thousand and nine. I just, I, you know, I split in good terms. Still really good friends with James Allen. He's in the room next to me in the studio complex that we run mm -hmm. together. Still good friends with uh, uh, Maloka and Davey. But don't see Alistair anymore. He's. I think he's living in Poland now. Um. So. Split in good terms, mm -hmm. and from about 2008, really about 2004, I'd actually kind of started my solo career in 2004 as public domain was starting to kind of tail off. So it kind of I had mm -hmm. something to kind of work on. And in 2009, I left, 2008, 2009, I left public domain. And then that was when I thought, right, this is, I'm on my own now. I make all the decisions. If I make any mistakes, it's, it's, it's down to you. me. It's, it's yeah, exactly. So it's time to kind of get my shit together. It's just, it's one of the tracks, well, even like before, like not so long ago, I wasn't there that in dance music as a whole okay. you know and I was always good pals with Stephen and supporting and stuff like that and obviously I liked loads so of stuff fault, is it? he's, 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 he's <laughs> certainly a massive a headlock <laughs> <laughs> totally, totally listen to that <laughs> <laughs> but that is one of the like standout tracks even as a wee guy I remember and like to the point where Mallorca invited me to I think it was a 2001 show and I was watching him perform it live and I had the chills I'm like man I grew up just even hearing that voice yeah, 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 yeah. and then obviously yourself was part of engineering the whole thing I mean it's it's pretty crazy but that it's it's that cocktail though that you know they're like that when's the next hit when's the next hit and it's like look it didn't work like that mate yeah, this it, came together through magic exactly do you know what I mean that, when you speak to Paul Keenan as well about like uh, you know Uniting Nations out of touch yeah so we've had Paul on before right at the very start of the he podcast just lives like right there he yeah, just yeah. lives right there yeah. right? it's a very similar story though it's like the variables we got it to Jules we got it to such and such yep. uh, someday at this uh, club was playing it and then everyone thought it was massive and they'd only given it to th given it to three people yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's amazing just how that it's momentum still, it's always can, little stepping can stone. build yeah, 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 yeah. and it's like number one in like 13 countries yeah, and all yeah. that you know tours the world and then it's oh, like yeah. when's the next hit when's the next hit it, it was an amazing time of my life I, c I can I can think back and remember the good times I, I've I 
spoken to the guys about this several times, especially in Mallorca. Um, I don't let the bad times outweigh the good times because when I do think back, there's the out the good times do totally outweigh the bad times, and I, mm-hmm. I'm of course. I'm still really proud of it. But I just I suppose in, in hindsight, I would have liked to have been a li- maybe even a little bit older. I wish we had more time to kind of make mm-hmm. the deal go in our favour. More savvy and with this stuff. A, have a music lawyer, have a better have better management in place, yeah. have a better record label manager, you know. So <laughs> there was a lot, a lot of ifs and buts, but you could you could drive yourself crazy. If I think back to that time and you could actually I could end up in a loony bin if I th- if I think about it too much, you know. Well so could Mallorca well oh, just on it some of the stuff they done, man. I know man, just stories to <sighs> blow your mind. Yeah, like yeah, stuff yeah. not for podcasts. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that kind of leads us on like obviously we're all part of the same scene you know and that's an, a monumental experience you know that that, that that happened there you know but see like from your point of view and through having those experiences and what you're doing now with the label and all of that what kind of advice would you give to like producers people making music or people that want to say get to your position or tour the world that's like their dream mm-hmm. like, you know if, is there anything that comes to mind maybe you've learned from mis- certain mistakes like, yeah you, know, you would that. do differently now I think I suppose one of the mistakes I used to make um, in 2010, uh, I was lucky enough to get offered a, an artist deal with Reset, you know, spinning records. And I suppose maybe like from about 2004 up until 2010, I think just to answer your question with one word is overkill. Mm-hmm. Don't do overkill. I was making, trying to make too many tracks. I was trying to do too many things. I was trying to do too many, make too many different styles. I suppose on social media, I was trying to do too much. It's just like overkill, overkill. You know, it's just that's the wrong way to go. It's the opposite of that. Take mm. your time with things. Don't post every day in Facebook. It's just silly things. You know, schedule your stuff. Maybe do like two or three posts a day that are actually interesting. They've got good content. As far as production goes, spend. I mean, I, I went from making like maybe ten or twelve tracks a month uh, a year to go into five or six when I signed to spinning because that was uh, Yorn the guy you remember Yorn at spinning one of the first things he said to me was he said Mark you're actually making too much music he said your tracks are really good and we like them in the office and obviously you've had releases in the label but we think you could improve a lot more if you just take your time and double the length of time you spend in your tracks just you know slow things down get the the wee details wee details you know better better techniques bigger sounds more layering all that all the stuff Mm -hmm. that kind of takes time basically so that's what I did Mm. And that's for me, 2008 to 2010, Julie, really when things started to kind of work out well for me on my solo career. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's basically because I started taking my time. I stopped worrying about, you know, oh, I need to do a track, I need to do a track. It's like, well, okay, I'll, I'll do a track, but yeah, I'm going yeah. to finish it and I'll, I can release it in two months instead of one month. Mm-hmm. So I just started taking more time. Quality and, over quantity. Exactly, mate, exactly. So that's probably the biggest bit of advice I can give to anybody. That's great advice. And that's day and age, at, at, the same, oh. at the same time, it's it's the last thing I'm taking a take a young guy take somebody that's like maybe 18, 19, 20 maybe they've had a couple of tracks and they're starting to get a wee buzz for themselves if you tell them to slow down and mm-hmm. take their time they'll they won't listen to you so it's trying to get that up across to them that that is the, the right way to go take your time don't be desperate for gigs don't be desperate to get success build, Just, it, build it with a long exactly. long mentality yeah you know it's like learn, learn your trade learn how to produce watch as many tutorials as you can try and work with different guys in the studio whether it involves you going to sit with somebody and you just sit and watch them or mm-hmm. you actually getting somebody in to help you with or doing a collaboration I'm not, I'm not saying like engineering but c- collaborate with mm-hmm. somebody that knows more than you mm-hmm. just try and let yourself be a sponge and soak in as much like experience and knowledge as you can with other guys that you maybe know. There might be somebody living around the corner that you know. There might be somebody in another city. Mm-hmm. Get talking to them in social media. You know, put, put, just get your get out there and just try and meet people. And, mm, definitely know. great advice. And it's funny you mentioned that these days tracks are coming out solid, even from artists that are that are doing well. You know, like I mean, not the most kind of popular ones. Like Eats everything and all that. They don't really need to release constant, but you get the ones that are doing well, but up and coming. And they're just churning, churning, churning because music's so disposable, I guess. Yeah, I mean, as, as well, I, I, maybe I think these days, like, all it really takes is one massive track for for a whole genre to get on your back and to, to wait for the next thing to happen. Like, if mm-hmm. you have a massive techno track and a massive trance track, everybody in the trance scene and the techno scene is going to be watching well, you like, know you. for the next one. Mm-hmm. So all it really takes is that one big massive track. Mm-hmm. If that takes you a year to make it or six months to make it, well, that's or just... Or ten years. Ex- <laughs> exactly. So it's like tr- try and not be so concerned about getting tracks, tracks, tracks finished. You know, just spend, take take time and get it done properly. And yes. that way it makes your tracks more memorable and you'll get that longevity, which is what a lot of people that's want. That's great. You know? Aye, absolutely brilliant. 
brilliant. I, I think mean, uh, we've done a brilliant podcast. It's been good, guys. It's been good. <laughs> it's been great. We bounced about from all sorts, yeah, 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 and yeah, uh, yeah. you know, from the early days to current, you know what's happening now with you, Mark. It's been brilliant. Thanks a lot. We need to. Class. I think we could do it again sometime. Yeah, Definitely. absolutely. If you're up for it. Yeah, we'll do it uh, the next time. <laughs> <time. laughs> just give it. Give us another <laughs> fifteen years to finish. I just don't wait that long to come down again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's been great. Uh, Mark Sherry, everyone. Mark Sherry, aye. Can I give us a little plug? Please, yes, guys? Do it. yeah, let, let's do it's it. Final out plugs. on Black Hole. You can buy it on CD and you can also buy it on iTunes. It's on uh, Beatport. You can buy it everywhere. And if you're a cheapskate, you can listen to it for free on Spotify. There we go. So there you go, guys. There you go. All, All go. Options, options covered. All options Mark covered. Sherry, everyone. Aye, Mark Sherry. Pleasure having you Thanks on. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers, Appreciate Mark. it.